So we've taken you on quite a tour this morning, um, from the gender revolution to the global economy to technological disruption. Um, uh, we wondered what it would be like to be a fashion designer designing in this context, especially one who has managed to build an independent global business in, in this context. Um, a real global citizen, Dries Van Noten, uh, one of my personal favorite designers, so we're really honored to have him here with us. We'll now speak to BOF's editor-at-large, Tim Blanks, about his incredible journey and designing in an, an ever-changing world. Thank you, Imran. Dries, what does, uh, what does the phrase citizen of the world mean to you? Citizens of the world. I think uh, the world became one big global place. And of course, uh, for me, being a fashion designer, inspired by the world, looking at the world, being a very curious person. I want to learn, I want to see, I want to, want to experience things. So for me, it's like it's an ideal situation. I, I feel that fashion's offered you a way to explore explore the planet, that you, of, of all designers, has been very engaged by other cultures in your work. For me, other cultures, of course, always have been kind of a, yeah, a starting point. But of course, I never took things very literal. Um, it's not that when I want to make a collection inspired on India, that I go now to India for a month and explore all things. No. Quite often, we take one element which we like, uh, we combine it, uh, and there I think creativity starts, because then you have an Indian element, but then you see something African which you also like, and you start to mix those things, and you start to make your something very personal of it. Um, for me, it's just like layering, it's like putting elements together. It's not only looking to things of the past, it's also bringing in things of the future, uh, because at the end, the final clothes don't have to be Indian or African inspired or ethnic inspired. It has to be clothes which people want to wear now and uh, clothes which people want to use to express who they are. And that for me is the final goal. Where do you think that comes from in you? I've always had this theory that Antwerp being at one point the, the, the city where the entire world came together, where all the merchants from everywhere would gather. It's where cultures combined in a hybrid way. And I, I wonder if it's something you feel is, is kind of genetic in a way, in the makeup of a creative person from, from Antwerp? For, for me, it's very difficult to answer that question because, of course, being born and raised and living in Antwerp, it's a very difficult thing to say, like, okay, this is now what Antwerp is, this is what my personality is, this is what my upbringing, my education is. So, um, for me, it's just like, like I don't really have uh, a lot of, of, how shall I say, uh, for me, the levels of importance are all kind of the same thing. I love high culture, I love low culture, I love things from everywhere. Um, I like to, to mix all those things and to make my personal melange of it. And I think maybe Antwerp indeed is a very good example of it still now because of the, the port and the diamond business. It's a very open city, it's a very generous city. Uh, people are there, I think, from 180 different countries and nationalities. So. It's like a very open thing, but it's not only there open in nationality-wise, but it's also like in art. You see very clearly in Antwerp a very good connection between music, dance, fashion, photography, art, all the different elements which are just becoming one big blur and a very creative blur, which I think is often very good. Let's see, another thing about Belgium mm -hmm. is it's kind of odd. I think people have quite, people do have quite a clear idea of Belgium, you know, in, in their minds, quite, quite a, a sort of cliched we notion. We don't, we don't have. No, <laughs> as, 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 as uh, narrow-minded outsiders. But, you know, in a way, I think of Belgium as the home of surrealism. And it feels like your point of view and the way that you layer and look at things is, is the way a surrealist looks at things, like literally surreal, surreality. Mm -hmm. So for me, for me, I try to make maybe to make like a new reality, not a surreal reality, but for me, I try to make like a new reality, which is something which is for me important, and also which can speak to a lot of people. Uh, because at the end, um, you can talk about fashion, you can create fashion, but the final goal is not only for commercial reasons, but that at the end people buy the clothes that we are making, 
and that people especially wear the clothes and use the clothes a little bit what, what to explain uh, who they are, to enhance their personality to, as a way of communication. And that for me is a very important thing. And f in one way or another, I want to make kind clothes, which is for me like, like something different, something surprising. But at the, at the end, the main goal is that it still speaks to, ever, to a lot of people. And, and, and winkles out something in their personality. I mean, do you think that when, you, when you're offering them this sort of buffet of, of very rich buffet of references, it's kind of I think everybody can pick, it, can, can pick their elements what they like. Um, I don't design total outfits. I design, of course, when I start with a new collection, I know where the end, what, what final image I want to create. But it's not that we say, okay, now we're going to make an outfit and you have to wear it with these shoes, this pant and this jacket and have to fit together, otherwise it doesn't work. Now, once I know a little bit what story I want to tell, I design really separate pieces. Pieces which have to speak to quite a lot of different people, body shape, culture, price-wise also. So all these different things. We don't have BIS collections, pre-collections, all these things. I work very long on one main collection, which is also very extended. But for me, that's a very easy system because then even the stores can buy into the collection things which really speak to them. It's not that we say, here is the package of the season and this you have to buy. We have a very large collection and there even the stores already can do kind of a, a selection of things but which for them is already like important to have in the store. And then afterwards, we do a lot of effort that the sales staff in the stores also have really kind of good education is a lot to say, but that they have very good information that they can share with the final customer. But by operating this way, the, by running counter to what the industry is doing now, are you making problems for yourself or do you think your life is a lot easier than when you look around at what your peers are putting themselves through? I don't know. I never experienced it the other way. So the good thing is that, that we love the way that we do it. And we always, as a company, we have been growing in a very organic way. We solve a problem when there is a problem. Of course, we have a business plan. We know how we want to do things. But when we, when we see an opportunity, we, we talk in, in a group and we say, okay, are we going to grab the opportunity? Yes and no. In that way, of course, it's, it's, it's a different way of working maybe than other houses. Uh, we've been under a lot of pressure, I think, eight, nine years ago by, by a lot of department stores to start now with, oh, what you have to do to keep the size of your, your shopping shop. You have to have a pre-collection because your sell-through or your turnover per square foot per month is not high enough compared with other brands. But then they forgot sometimes, okay, that we have a very high peak maybe when the collection comes in and that maybe indeed afterwards it's a bit more slow. But for me, I think it's also like, like there is so much fashion, there is so much images in the world. Do we really need now to create even more images, to create more emotions and things like that? I think fashion for me is a very emotional thing. Uh, create clothes is a very emotional thing. And I think you have to be careful not to to use that too much. You have to be sparse with it, to just place it on the right moment. And for me, that right moment is a fashion show. Well, uh, the fashion show, which you've celebrated in your incredible um, new book, uh, a two-volume... Uh, two um, extravaganza. Extravaganza, <laughs> which, um, full disclosure, I've worked on with you. But uh, is, is um, as much as it celebrates the grandeur of what you've done, I, I also like some of the, the little intimate, I, lo I love some of the little intimate moments where actually you did try other ways of doing things. There was a moment where you looked around at designers becoming creative directors and you thought, oh, perhaps I'd better do that. And it didn't work, did it? It didn't work at all uh, for me, no. Um, it, but it was, it was a long time ago. Uh, it was end of the 90s. I think Tom Ford changed a lot in the fashion world there, doing Gucci making accessories, in fact, the core of the business for a lot of houses, and, um, and just doing things where, where he was kind of really kind of a, not a, role, a real role of a fashion designer, but just creating a whole image of a house. And for me, um, end of the 90s was a difficult period because Christine Mattis, my partner at that time, uh, the business partner, uh, passed away. And uh, we've been approached at that time also by, by groups because it was the time that all the smaller designers like Gilles Sander, uh, McQueen, all those houses were sold to bigger groups. 
So we thought, we thought also we were sitting around the table talking like, okay, is this now the way we have to go? Do we have to put now much more emphasis on accessories? Uh, do we have to make more kind of a cold fashion? Because for us, person, the personality is always so important. And it was also the period that the personal model disappeared. I think it's very nice to see in the book, you see smiling models trying to find eye contact with the public. Uh, there was kind of a very human aspect to a fashion show. And at a certain moment, you had kind of the supermodels, which were kind of somewhere over there. They didn't smile. They were like a straight look, very like it was. It was such so much different changes for us that we said, okay, maybe we have to do it also. Like maybe that's the future. Maybe our business model and way that I saw fashion is over. So I think it was period 1898, uh, 99. We did also two or three fashion shows, and I talk about it in the book also, and we talked a lot about that, that period, uh, when you had to write the text. And it was just like, yeah, okay, no, this is not me. And also the customers didn't expect it, and didn't, didn't want it for me. So commercially seen, it was not like a good move. And um, the reaction on that was that I made a collection purely about India, which has always been my, one, of, one of my big loves. And of course, in an area where that fashion became more cold, making an Indian collection full of color and explosion of embroideries and things like that was maybe an interesting thing. At least it was different, but it was also exactly the period of 9-11. So it was a very difficult time, but the strange thing is our house always have been, done, been uh, doing good in times it's been difficult. Do you think that you'd be able to do a collection like that now? Um, now that there's the most enormous cultural sensitivity in fashion about appropriating other... It's, it's actually no longer inspiration, it's appropriation, and it becomes a whole other issue. In the book, you did, you did mention that it would be very difficult to do a collection inspired by elements of Iraqi or Iranian culture now, for example. Um, you, you, turned more towards the art world for inspiration? I look now more to the art world uh, for several reasons, because of course, for me, there is so much to discover in the world. And uh, I look now a lot to ethnic fashion and ethnic garments and, and embroideries and all these things. So the moment that really the, uh, the first art fairs came, came up, contemporary art became very important for me also. And you start to, to find new ideas, but quite often I use them ideas which I see from, from, uh, from contemporary art, I still make elements and references to ethnic things. But indeed, it's became more difficult now to, to, to say, uh, so uh, yesterday evening we talked already about it, uh, we had uh, this winter men's collection which was based on traditional things, which, which is how the cliches from men's wear where you have like, okay, you have a, a Ran sweater, you have kind of a Nordic sweater with like the black and white motifs, and you have a Peruvian sweater. So we had English fabrics, all the heritage things, so everything was there, all the ingredients were there, which we played with in all the different silhouettes. We posted one Peruvian sweater, a photo of that sweater, which was top embroidered with glass beads and the whole thing on Instagram, and there was a huge reaction against it, that I was a thief, that I had to keep uh, my own things, uh, that I couldn't appropriate uh, motives which have a special meaning to Peruvian people. It's Peruvian sweater, it's two llamas, I'm sorry. It's nobody's property, nobody invented it. It became kind of a reference, and I, for everybody references icons and reference things like this. For me, it's an iconic garment. And I think people in the 60s and 70s have worn those, uh, those llama sweaters. For also for a reason, because they went to Peru, they loved uh, ethnic things, they loved to wear all these things. And by using those elements in a rather authentic way, we reference also to that whole, all those layers of information which are behind that. So it's, so, it's such a pity that, that now we wouldn't be able to use that, that only ethnic ethnicity which I could look at is Belgian folklore. Yeah, so, uh, so that, that makes no sense. I, don't, I, don't th I, I think that the point is almost it's not what the ethnicity is. It is the mere fact that it is somebody's culture that you're, you know. It's, it just happened with Lueve and an, and an Ecuadorian bag which they wove, in, wove into a sort of <coughs> shoulder bag. And exactly the same thing. There was a, there's been a huge outcry on, on the internet about, about 
taking, stealing somebody else's mm -hmm. culture. But, but then you, you, you've referenced the kimono so much in, in your clothing. And, and yeah, but, but that's a strange thing for people. Some elements are more holy than other things. So for me, it would be also the same thing that the Belgian chef couldn't reference the Japanese kitchen anymore or couldn't use olive oil. It's the same thing. So for me, those, all those elements which we have, all the visual things, are things which we play with. And it's not that I exactly copy them, and it's not that I want to hurt people by using certain things. Of course, we are careful in, in the way that we work, so we, we think very carefully if we use elements. But for me, it's not that I want to make soldiers by using some military elements in, in my collection. It's all those things, it's all those, yeah, it's like the alphabet of fashion, which I use to create my own things. And sometimes, especially menswear, you have to work with recognizable things. You have to work with things which a man recognizes, like a jeans, a parka, a classic coat, a blazer, all these things, because men sometimes are a little bit scared to put too many steps forward at the same time. So in a wardrobe that we create, there always have to be some references to things what they know. So do you, th do you think actually it's, it's getting harder to do stuff like that? that things that are very familiar to people are suddenly someone's property. It, it, it's, I think, one of the unlucky disadvantages of having, living in the world that we are living now with, with internet and all the social media and everything. So it would be a pity that, that with this incredible tool that we have now, that our world would become smaller just because everybody has to become so careful of what you say, how you do it, uh, what you use, because immediately you can be attacked by so many other people who think that they have right to attack you. But what's the, the upside, upside of technology, technology for you, of, 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 this, of the digital age? Oh, information. Information is so fantastic, and you can share things. I think for me, uh, social media is too, but yeah, like everything in life, it has advantages and disadvantages, I think. See, uh, one thing that, that stands out in your work is, is its consistent humanism. When I mean, you were talking before about the human element and what you do, um, do you think that with the scale of things and the speed of things, that fashion has lost a little bit of its humanity? I, yes and no. It's again, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to place it exactly because there is so many different types of fashion out there. Uh, you have like the fashion house, you have small individual young designers who start now their own business and things like that. So I think that's again one of the opportunities of, of uh, internet and social media that, that now even small voices can be heard. Um, of course, there is, there is something lost and I think Maybe it also has to do something even with communication. We are here maybe now on the voices of business of fashion, but now business of fashion being so important for so many people, every morning you wake up, ding, there is, there is a message and breaking news and all these things. You start to look to fashion also more, automatically you start to look to fashion more as a business model. And you start, the business side becomes also more important. You have, of course, also on the other side, completely on the other side, you have the whole celebrity cultures. Now the, the product what Kim Kardashian uses to keep her skin so beautiful is becoming more important than what maybe a designer makes. So all these things, we are a little bit lost somewhere, and I think the human side is, is lost maybe quite a lot. So what would be the remedy for that, do you think? I mean, we were talking about um, the... The, the, the celebrity side of fashion and then the business side of fashion. And I think it's so interesting that the business of fashion, like people used to read style.com, it used to be mm -hmm. their Bible. And it's so interesting that there's this evolution where people have gone on from reading about fashion shows and clothes and things to reading about the actual business of fashion. Mm -hmm. What could evolve beyond that, do you think? You did mention that somewhere along the line, what's being lost is the beauty mm -hmm. of fashion. So, yeah, that's what we're also we're talking about. It would be great if there was also kind of a website besides the business of fashion, that, which is called the beauty of fashion. Because I think that part of the information is, partly, is mostly lost now. Things where you tell about how beautiful our profession can be, how beautiful it is to, to be busy with all those craftspeople who do those incredible embroideries. Not only that side, but also the social side. The, thing, the, whole, the whole aspect of the, the purpose of fashion, to make people more beautiful, to even sometimes to create a dream 
because I think we lost a little bit the dream of fashion also. So everything became kind of product, became a system, became a business, became a celebrity. Even this whole celebrity culture became kind of a system of celebrities being paid to wear certain outfits and all these things. So, and you don't have to fool people. People feel all those things that you are manipulated. So in, in one way or another, uh, for me, the dream, bringing the dream back is very important. Do you, do you remember when you started? I mean, the word diversity is, is um, thrown around so much now as, as being a, it's, it's a critical new kind of touch paper in, in the industry. Do you remember when you started, did it feel to you like fashion was more instinctively diverse when you first started? It was a question which we didn't really ask. Uh, as, I, as I told already, I don't really have kind of that. For me, all the diversity is not important because for me, it's a normal thing. It's there. For me, I respect as much. For me, it's one big world. And uh, so in that way, it's, it becomes a little bit strange that you now you need to have kind of a, the right balance between the colors of the models and, and, and your fashion show and things like that, which is one way or another maybe also not, not correct, because sometimes we, when we choose girls to work for our shows, or boys, of course, uh, in the menswear shows, we just look to the character. What is this person telling us? What is she adding to the clothes? Because that's, for me, still very important. I don't want a certain girl because she's that girl. I want a girl because she adds something to the clothes, which is also one of the things which we lost in the 90s. Uh, end of the 90s, girl became more neutral, just like a puppet, which was telling then the story of the designer, where in the early, in the 80s and the 90s, you had Pat Cleveland showing an outfit, you had Christina de Koning, which was then a completely different type of person, but she was wearing clothes. And that was the nice thing about the 100 fashion show. But now we'll go talk Grace about Jones something else. Grace Jones on the catwalk. Yeah. <laughs> and just an incredible mm -hmm. cast of characters. Do you, one, one thing about communication, do you, would you hope that with all the channels of communication we have now, that your story could become a business model, in a way, that the story of your own business, which celebrates independence and celebrates a sort of a, a real commitment to to the individual. I think could become a. I think it can be completely independent, but I think independency is just that you don't have to copy an existing business model. We achieved as a company and as a group of people, what we achieved, it's more also often by coincidence. Elements which were there, we grabbed the opportunity in a whole organic way. But I think that's now the, new t the nice thing about the time now, that people can find other business models. There are so many options, there are so many possibilities. When you talk now with, you, with, with students at fashion school, uh, a few years ago, like 10 years ago, when I was doing the first time those, those talks with, with the students in the uh, Fashion School of Antwerp, it was all, everybody was dream was, okay, I want to be like the uh, new uh, Nicolas Chesquier, I want to be kind of uh, two years and I want to have my fashion show in Paris or in London. Now when you talk with those students, they say, yes, I, but together with my brother, I want to start like a small company, hand-knitted sweaters, very small, just uh, sell them maybe in one store and all these things. So, there or for them, everything is now possible because it's, it's the material is there, so we can do, they can do things like that. That's wonderful, though. It gives hope. It's, 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 I'm, a, I'm a positive person in that way. No, I'm very happy. And, and what do you feel your biggest challenge is going forward? Um, my biggest challenge? It's, 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 for me, it's really fantastic times. It's going very well, the business. Not good. But... Um, there are, there are so many challenges for the moment. So there are so many new things which, which I still would like to discover, which I still would like to do. There are still so many stories which I would like to tell with my clothes. So uh, look, really looking forward to the future. So in about 30 years, we'll be working on the, the book for the second 100 <laughs> shows. No, thank you. <laughs> I'll be really old. Thank you very much, Jules. Thank you.